Welcome to a special series of the Exceptional Advisor Podcast. Hi, I'm Bob Powell. Over the next several weeks, this special series will highlight exceptional advisors in these extraordinary times. We hope this series helps you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences in light of the unique challenges and emerging norms of the current times. My guests today are Christine Gaze, the founder and managing partner of Purpose Consulting Group, and Kathleen Pritchard, a partner in Purpose Consulting Group. So, Christine, welcome to the podcast. Kathleen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to have you on. Before we get started with our, the nature of our discussion today, uh, Christine, do you mind telling us about Purpose Consulting Group and a little bit about your background? Sure, Bob, and thanks for thanks for having us. Uh, Purpose Consulting Group develops practice management content that helps advisors grow and lead their teams more effectively. Um, and this year marks my 25th year, if you can believe it, in this wow. business. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, before I started Purpose, I was the head of practice management at TD Ameritrade. I ran global professional development at Alliance Bernstein, and I was a leader in Morgan Stanley's private bank, uh, among among many things. And I'll, I'll let Kathleen uh, talk about herself Great. now. No, I'd like to also thank you, Bob, and thank the Investments and Wealth Institute for the opportunity to share some of our insights on this podcast. Our pleasure. Uh, in terms of my background, I've actually been in the business 34 years, so I guess I'm really dating myself. <laughs> I started out as an advisor. I've held roles in sales management, training, national accounts marketing, and practice management at various firms through my career. Um, immediately before I joined the consulting world, I spent 11 years as the global spokesperson and head of practice management at Leg Mason. And I'm just really excited to have joined forces with Christine, whom I've known and respected for a long time, uh, as a partner at Purpose Consulting. Hmm. So the topic for our discussion is insights for FAs in a virtual world during COVID-19 and beyond. Can you tell us a little bit about the insights you're going to share with us on virtual work? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that I that we think really distinguishes the content that we develop is research. And, you know, there are so many virtual work, you know, articles out there, and we've certainly read them all. Um, but what we're really interested in are unique best practices. And, and as we look forward, like, what are the long term applications uh, and implications that FAs need to consider? So, we talk to a number of billion plus dollar FA teams in our network. We interviewed IWI board members, our friends. Uh, we talked to a number of successful wholesalers. And we also collected ideas from academics in communication and psychology. And we did this to assemble what we think are some non-obvious insights to, with respect to remote work. Mm. Obviously, remote work in the COVID-19 era is uh, almost becoming uh, commonplace. And, and uh, so what are some of the best practices in client communication that you've observed with advisory teams? Yeah, well, I would say during the crisis, it was really working to ensure that you had clear and calming messaging to clients. The really great FAs that we talked to have been working overtime in the crisis and, and really helping to focus clients' attention on what they can control. So we've seen um, FAs educating clients on, on how they can help take action, which I think is really important because, you know, as we experience this dislocation um, in the market, place. I mean, when when the advice is often to, you know, just stay the course, clients can feel, you know, a bit, you know, impotent. So helping them take action to uh, re-educating them um, and uh, and focusing them on rebalancing or tax loss harvesting, I, I think that really helps them feel like they have some modicum of control in a situation that feels, um, you know, out of control in many ways. Hmm. And also, I mean, the CARES Act um, provisions provided a lot of opportunity for, you know, for dialogue and tax saving action with, you know, with clients. So, you know, having the discussion with regard to potentially suspending, you know, required minimum distributions. Um, and for some, I mean, I think this has reduced income 
um, in a way that's created a window for Roth conversion eligibility for some that never existed before. I mean, my Mm -hmm. in-laws FA was really proactive in running the conversion calculation and recommending a Roth conversion, which led to tax savings. And my mother-in-law is a former CPA, so this advice was highly appreciated. Now, on the other hand, my parents' FA um, has been nowhere to be found, which has really forced me to play the role of educator for them. So um, I'll give you one guess, Bob, uh, as to which FA is getting fired um, (laughs) post-COVID. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think I can guess right on that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other observation, uh, you know, just with regard to action taking, um, estate planning has popped to the top of the list of important things for some clients. And we heard this from a number of FAs and, and I've experienced it myself. I mean, my husband and I are, you know, newly married the last couple of years. So we're halfway through updating our wills and estate documents. And so it's on us, you know, to give our estate attorney the language for the updates. And I think about this now every time my husband goes to the grocery store. So, mm. um, so these things that you, you know, that you put off, um, you know, are top of mind, I, I, I think, yeah. or at least for us anyway. You know, I'll, I'll mention with respect to estate planning, um, I can tell you that in my hometown, we're running a series of webinars and, and a, an upcoming webinar will feature an estate planning attorney who will be talking about the mistakes that people are making during the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the sort of the, the harriedness around updating healthcare proxies or durable powers of attorney or, and whatnot, because you're right, estate planning is a, is a incredibly important topic and perhaps even more incredibly important in a day and age like today, where the possibility of you becoming sick or dying uh, seems, um, seems greater than, than normal. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, I can actually jump on that too. My husband and I uh, relocated to Tennessee in September and our documents were completely done in the state of Connecticut. So on our to-do list was to hire an estate attorney and have the documents redone for Tennessee. And all of a sudden that jumped way to the top of the list when this crisis happened. To your point, Bob, when the risks of you know getting sick um, – God forbid, you know, passing away from it, none of our documents would have worked in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So we also jumped on that train. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would also tell you that in terms of best practices and client communication, what our research showed is that you really need to meet clients where they are. And what the advisor said is that they were doing more active listening than they had ever done before. And not just confirming goals, but really, really listening to fears and concerns. Mm -hmm. And some of them even mentioned that they did not do a good job of that during the financial crisis of 08. Um, So some advisors that we talked to were extremely proactive in raising cash positions in their clients' portfolios early on, early in March, both for the peace of mind for their clients, but also to make sure that they were able to take advantage of buying opportunities at a later date. Another best practice that was shared repeatedly was to revisit the financial plan and demonstrate the impact of current market volatility on that plan. And this is one of those areas where video conferencing came into play, that ability to share your screen and walk your client through the impact of the volatility in the markets on the plan, uh, they have found extremely powerful and very well received by their clients. Mm. And then we did have, we did also also have a lot of advisors talk to us about 08 and say that, you know, they no longer assume their clients are fine. Uh, if anything, they're over communicating by phone, email, video conferencing, and their clients are really expressing appreciation for it. Mm. So in terms of meeting clients where they are, did, did you get a sense of uh, where clients are with respect to di- their different life stages, uh, pre-retirees versus retirees or mid-career uh, clients and and how things may have been different in terms of uh, what the approach might have been or the action steps might have been. Absolutely. Absolutely. A $2 billion team that we talked to out in the Pacific Northwest was really, really paying attention to life phase, especially when they they were the team that was proactively uh, raising cash positions. Um, And, you know, they also mentioned it was something that that they weren't paying a lot of attention to in 08. And I know that I experienced that with my own financial advisor and we were in conversations and, you know, 08 was 12 years ago. And I actually had to say to him, we are in a different life phase 
today. Mm. And we are viewing this differently. So I think that's a really important point. Yeah. So two things two things more about this topic. One is, uh, obviously, if you're not skilled in af- active listening, now would be a good time to uh, become better skilled about that uh, about that trait. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, that it's not an easy thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we've all met a lot of advisors and a lot of advisors are, are not good at this. And my advice would be slow down, you know, ask those leading questions. It's not about you. It's the stuff that we all heard as we came up in the business. You know, you got, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, but it, it, it's important to remind people of this and to really draw your clients out and understand what their concerns and fears are, Mm -hmm. because this is, I I mean, this is the scariest time of my life. I can certainly say that. Uh, Of most everyone's life, I think. Yeah. So, so the other thing about uh, calming clients is the notion of many advisors that I've spoken to and many customers of advisors suggest the degree to which they felt calm was the degree to which there was a plan in place, an, an investment policy statement, a financial plan, a retirement policy statement, something that became a touchstone. Um, did you have a sense that uh, that there was a correlation between having a plan in place uh, in advance of this and and someone's calmness and, and uh, comfort level? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think particularly, uh, you know, all of those things, the financial plan and investment policy statement, if that's appropriate, but having that to go back to, to reorient, to ground, you know, having advisors have an opinion, that's very, very important. Synthesize all the news that's coming at them, have an opinion. All of those really help when you're working with clients. Um, if you have focused purely on the investment side and you haven't put a lot of those pieces in place, Times of market disruption are much more difficult. Mm. So obviously, a crisis is not necessarily a, a, a convenient time to talk about marketing. But uh, you made some observations about advisor marketing efforts during this pandemic. Yeah, I'm going to start with a quick one, and then Christine's got a great story to tell. Um, one of the things that we observed is the difference that it makes when you put yourself back in the equation with your marketing efforts. So, for example, like most people out there, I've received a lot of emails inviting me to join a call or a webinar to hear insights from some speaker. Now, typically those generic emails, I hate to say it, that generally get deleted. But the ones I pay attention to are the ones where advisors have added a personal note as to why they think it would be a good use of my time. And even better, the ones who follow up afterwards with a summary of what they thought the most salient points were. That kind of personalization makes all the difference. And Christine, I know you have a great story to share here in terms of advisor marketing efforts. Yeah, I mean, I talked to one really terrific team um, and the president, Andrew Alpvest of a a great RIA in New York. He shared, you know, that his team uh, recently did a highly successful virtual prospecting event. Um, And so his team has a strong niche with healthcare professionals, and we all know they've got you know, empty waiting rooms and elective surgeries are canceled. So in addition to the educational forums they've been providing for their clients, they put on a webinar uh, a few weeks ago with insights on the PPP, and they drew 150 business owner prospects um, that were, you know, sort of in their pipeline. And 11 of these prospects requested a virtual meeting after. So I think the moral of this story um, I think in part, the crisis favors larger FAs that have the resources and are able to sort of spring into action. Um, But another FA that I interviewed um, that the IWI audience knows uh, and loves well, Kevin Sanchez, he's an FA in UBS's uh, institutional consulting group and the former IWI board chair, shared, a, you know, I think a well-worn quote um, that I think is highly apropos. Um, he's like, I always have to be aware that my best client is somebody else's best prospect. And mm-hmm. I think these are really strange times, but as we de- we've demonstrated with the discussion we've had so far, it provides a really great impetus for complacent clients to move when they recognize that they're not getting the quality of advice that they want which I personally think offers a really terrific opportunity for SEMAs and CBWAs to shine. 
Mm. Sounds like uh, Christine, your, your your parents are probably fall in that camp of um, <laughs> right uh, uh, clients that are subject to move given their dissatisfaction. Yeah, or- without a doubt, and it, and so something like this this crisis where there are really specific actions that you should be taking in your financial plan and. Um, you know, with asset location and um, and uh, and the types of vehicles you're using and what you're taking. And so, if you're not getting that advice, if you're not getting that prompt from your advisor, then what are you paying for? Hmm. So, um, any other unique strategies for engaging clients or prospects that you unearth? Yeah, I, you know, one of the interesting ones that we came across, we were interviewing a top wholesaler at an asset manager, does over a billion dollars in business a year. He's he's amazing and he's an incredible speaker, brings a lot of value to the advisors he works with. But he talked about how he got into doing virtual client events. And early March, he started, he's always an early adopter, but in early March, he started with virtual happy hours and he would do them with teams. And And when he was on with a team, he would just casually say, you know, I have a series of really timely presentations on the following topics that I've built. They're really tight, about 20, 25 minutes. What do you guys think about getting together a group of 20 to 30 of your clients and we'll do a virtual event for them? And at first he was getting resistance. And then he realized that the reason he was getting resistance was that they were uncomfortable with the technology. So he added to his little pitch, and I will train you and your team on the technology if you need it. Mm-hmm. And that made all the difference. Mm-hmm. So he started training the teams. And then he did one other thing that was really important. He asked each team that he did an event for if he could invite one to two other advisors from their firm just to join and listen so that they could understand how it all works and, you know, what they could expect if they decided to do one. And all the advisors said yes. So he started out his first week, he did one. The next week he did three. And now he's doing three a day. And he basically says that, you know, first of all, the clients love it. They don't have to leave home. They don't have to, you know, get dressed in any special clothes. They can log in and in a half an hour, get some really important information. The advisors love it because they know they're bringing value. And I mean, this wholesaler said, it's going to change the way I wholesaler. Why would I drive you know, 30 minutes, an hour to a hotel where I had to pay for the ballroom, pay for the food, then to present, then to get home when I can do these and be so much more productive. Mm. I suspect this crisis will change forever the way wholesalers work and the way uh, the clients of wholesalers work with them. And it'd be interesting to see whether, it, uh, for how long it continues and, and uh, perhaps for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know what? The wholesalers that adapt like he did, and, and adopt these new practices and these new ways of working are going to be the ones that survive and rise to the top. And Christine, I think you have another take on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great example. Um, I was also talking with uh, with Noel Picaro Brown, who Bob, I know who you talked to uh, recently on a, mm-hmm. on a podcast. So she may have actually shared the same story on, on your podcast. But I, I thought she was doing something was so simple and elegant, but so, you know, seemingly effective. She just scheduled a couple of fireside chats, her favorite term, uh, with, uh, with portfolio managers, with small groups of clients. And, you know, I think the beauty here is in the simplicity. Um, Noelle Picaro Brown, as many of us know her, is so passionate and well-spoken. So I'm confident that she made this event personal and meaningful for her clients with her commentary. And all she had to do was interview, you know, a PM and facilitate, uh, you know, the, the Q&A discussion. So this was really a cakewalk for her, um, but a really great way to provide education, reassurance, reassurance and, and value to her clients. Mm. The one thing that she is also doing that was interesting to me is that she's inviting her clients to a Zoom call with uh, Portland's most promising young opera singer and songwriter, and uh, so oh, she's cool. yeah she's giving um, her clients a a private concert with a with an up and coming opera singer. So fascinating stuff. Such a cool and creative uh, creative idea. She invited me to that, so I'm I'm uh, looking forward to it. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about client engagement in the virtual world. Uh, what have you noted about the way FA teams are communicating uh, with each other? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, team team practices uh, are so important right now. Um, and if you didn't have a well functioning team heading into this crisis, you know, I think you're at a severe you know, disadvantage trying to manage through it. So one of my favorite people to interview is Heather Locus, who is one of the founding partners of Velasa Denverno and Fult. Uh, it's a four plus billion dollar um, RAA in the Chicagoland area. Um, and her team has been doing a daily huddle since the, you know, since the crisis began. Um, it's led by the CIO and the head of investments. And the goal is really to make sure that everyone's up to speed on where we are with the virus, uh, what they think the implications are for our portfolios, and what the big picture economic outlook is. So she talked about like the fact that it really makes sh- it, her team feel like they're in touch with the investment committee and ensures, and I think this is really important, that everyone is message ready and that they feel confident to, you know, to deliver um, messaging to clients. So Mm -hmm. she said they also recently added a, you know, a segment to this since um, the really tough questions are getting, you know, uh, routed up to the CIO and the head of investment. So, um, they took the opportunity on this call to, you know, to prep the wealth managers who are really kind of on the front lines to say, like, here's what we're hearing and here's how we're responding to it, which allows the wealth managers to have, you know, better, you know, answers and, again, feel, you know, more confident. Um, Mm -hmm. she also just talked about the fact that the, you know, that this daily huddle, at least during, uh, you know, the crisis makes the team feel connected and they've got a bunch of, you know, 20 somethings that live alone. So this is an important source of connection first thing in the morning to get everybody, you know, focused on the, you know, on the task at at hand. Mm. It is stressful to be at home and and be young and and perhaps lonely, right? Where you might have been weeks ago in an office environment where you could walk down the hall and shoot the breeze with someone or or get an update or talk, talk about a problem. But now you have to um, do that from the discomfort of your home. It's or com- I, it's true, and I think it's something that you know. A, the majority of the, you know, the IWI certificate base, those that have CMAs and CPWAs, I mean, the average level of experience is 20 plus years in the business. And so, you know, I think it's an important public service announcement to say, you know, if you haven't been doing these things to really tighten the message of your young people, to really ensure that there's a feedback loop that makes them feel connected, to really ensure that they feel confident and, you know, and educated, it's really important that you, you figure it out. You work to mm-hmm. install those things in the future because you can't, um, you can't take for granted, you know, what you know and the value of your experience and, and how that maybe makes you feel, you know, more more confident. You really have to put yourself in the position of your youngest teammates and think about, you know, what avenues can you use to ensure that you have, you know, on-demand training and, you know, and development like these calls that makes them feel, you know, ready and able uh, to engage with uh, clients effectively. I have a personal experience I I have to share with you since you just triggered it. In the year 2008, in the fall, I was sitting in a uh, financial planning conference uh, at lunch as the market was collapsing. And I was sitting across from a newly minted uh, certified financial planner, and um, he was eating his lunch, looking at me, ashen faced, <laughs> saying, uh, saying, and words, and said words to this effect I'm beginning to doubt. Um, everything I ever told any of my clients, and, and and clearly, right, he had not ever been through a market cycle like that, and didn't have who to turn to, yeah. and probably could have benefited from the wisdom of an older advisor who had been through maybe 1987 or or uh, or other years like that. So. Yeah, the you know the value of the wisdom of experience, I think, certainly spikes in in times like this. So. Mm. So I, I took you off your yeah. uh, off. Uh, the, there's there's other things that uh, team meetings are, are occurring too, right? In terms of uh, end of day calls. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think the bottom line is that any regularly scheduled meetings that the team had been doing should be replicated remotely. So you should continue with all those, but you're also going to find opportunities where you need to add some meetings because of the remote work environment. So this example um, is a team that added a daily operations call and they do it an hour before the market closes. Um, And the purpose of that call is to make sure that there is nothing falling through the cracks in terms of actions that need to be done for clients. I mean, when they're in the office and they're face to face, they can pop their head out the door of their office or sometimes just holler out um, to one of their uh, CSAs and and check on a trade or check on some, um, you know, something being done. So they've found that to be a really good addition to make sure that all the I's are getting dotted and the T's are getting crossed. Nothing's falling through the cracks. Hmm. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Christine. I was going to say, Christine uh, also uh, got a great story about these client team calls that I think was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, so we talked about kind of the broad, you know, team call, daily huddle, the end of uh, end of day, you know, kind of operational huddles. Um, I'm going to bring up BDF again because they're just a, you know, a purveyor of best practices. You know, they have... Um, uh, they have uh, client team calls. So they have on, on these calls, they have ensembles of wealth managers who are on the front lines, planners who are more behind the scenes and, you know, and admins who do, you know, a lot of the, you know, paperwork and operational work. And the purpose of these calls is to really kind of talk about tactical, you know, execution. So the goal is to discuss, you know, client plans that are, you know, in progress, things that are live and happening. And so the dedicated teams are reviewing specific plans, coordinating logistics, and they're also sharing issues that clients, you know, have raised or that they've, you know, encountered um, trying to implement these things. So it's another uh, venue for ensuring that there's the sm- smooth coordination of of uh, client planning and, and tactics, um, but it's also, I think, a um, an opportunity where all the client teams on the line, you know, everyone is able to sort of learn con- collectively. If someone ran into an issue, you know, last week, I now know how to, you know, to solve it when I, you know, when a, a, a client raises an, an issue of, of similar nature. Hmm. So that's a good way, obviously, for teams to do the business of their business. Um, but oftentimes teams are connected culturally and socially and, and work is not just about work, but also the connections you form at work. Um, are there some creative ways that teams are staying connected virtually? Absolutely. I, and I think it's not just in our business, but it's across it's across the whole world. People are doing these things. But we have heard from, you know, most teams are doing some form of this. So whether it's a, a virtual happy hour, and this is all about, you know, engaging to your point socially, to promote connectivity, to promote the culture. Um, but we've also heard interesting things like, you know, uh, teams of ha- having trivia nights or other kinds of game nights. There's an app called Jackbox where you can set up these game nights. Uh, Netflix Netflix watch parties, uh, or even just virtual lunch. Um, And all of those things can be really great in keeping those personal and meaningful connections going. Um, But I would give one word of caution on this. Uh, You you need to think about it and you don't want to do too many. Because even though it has a, it's a social uh, event, there's still, because it's a social event that's connected with work, there's still a sense of obligation and a sense of being on. So you don't want to overdo these, um, but have enough that people do stay connected. Certainly tap into everyone on the team for ideas. You know, Let different people run them and set them up, and that will go a long way towards keeping your team uh, tight and you know just involved in each other's lives, which I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I've got another idea, but first I just, I mean, this is the year of the zoom happy hour, the zoom lunch meeting. Um, you know, I don't think we, uh, yeah, I can't count on one hand, the amount that we have scheduled professionally and personally, my, my husband and I, my husband runs a, he's a patent attorney and he runs a law firm. And when you have a group of electrical engineers who are also patent attorneys, many are highly introverted sitting on a zoom call, having lunch together, like, like you know, 
some, some business in the, you know, in the world. In the world. Um, <laughs> But there's another uh, tactic, and you know, again, this comes this comes from a bigger team, uh, and I think it actually reemphasizes some of the points that I've made um, already about the importance of leadership. Um, this team has had uh, three town halls since the crisis uh, started via Zoom. Um, and, and I, I, you know, the first one was really sort of what's going on. Second one is like, how, you know, how are you doing? What do you need? Um, you know, and this last one is like, hey, they've extended our stay at home orders. So what are we doing? What's our, you know, what's our plan? How's the firm doing financially? Um, you know, the way that they've, they've uh, approached these, the, you know, the CEO of this particular RAA is leading these discussions. They send out a survey monkey in advance to see what questions people have. And he starts with, you know, his own thoughts and he reads and answers every question. Everyone's on Zoom, their mic's on. So people are asking questions live, you know, but the thing um, that he shared with me about this, you know, tactic that I think is really important to keep in mind is that we can't underestimate the need for reassurance and guidance, not just for our clients in this, you know, in this time, but for our employees. So as unemployment figures rise, um, as stay at home orders are extended as, uh, as layoffs, um, and furloughs and uh, pay cuts, you know, kind of uh, dominate the headlines. This really unsettles employees, especially staff workers. So, you know, I think the lesson is you more communication is better right now. Um, and you can't just do it once. You really sort of have to keep doing it because there's a fresh batch of bad news <laughs> like waiting for you um, with every uh, news cycle. Yeah, I can only imagine, you know, it, for many people, there's that day is filled with dread about whether they'll get laid off, furloughed, asked to take a pay cut, et cetera, right? I mean, this is a business where Absolutely. where if you're depending on AUM fees and you're watching revenue decline, obviously people can, can see that there's pressure on revenue and profit perhaps inside a, a firm. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, and there have been some really good, I, I think, proactive announcements. I mean- um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a number of firms kind of come out and say, you know, we're not planning any layoffs for, um, 2020. Um, mm -hmm. but we've also seen, you know, the other side of that, um, where, you know, where furloughs and, and pay cuts and, um, whatnot abound. So, mm. So we, we've talked about, you mentioned a second ago about, uh, setting up virtual meetings and, and the, the importance of, training. Uh, I've sat on plenty of Zoom meetings where you spend a good 10 or 15 minutes training people live because they've never been in a Zoom meeting. Are there some best practices that you might recommend for running an effective virtual meeting? Yeah, we, we've we actually done a lot of in-depth work on team communication and accountability and leadership. And we realized that all of these concepts really require um, translation for the virtual world. So we've built out a, a suite of content to support this. Now, we don't have time to do a, a deep dive in this today, um, but we can share just, we assembled just eight top tips for running effective, you know, virtual meetings. We, we really think to begin, it's important to keep in mind the goal of virtual meetings in our mind is to create a meaningful connection. So if you go at it with that, you know, mindset, I think you'll, you know, do a better job than, you know, than not. And we've all been to virtual meetings these days, uh, small and large and for varied reasons. And some have produced meaningful connections, I'm betting, <laughs> at least mine have, um, and some did not. And what's interesting to note is that size was not the distinguishing factor. You know, I think the difference is often whether the meetings were well-planned and, and facilitated. Uh, when they are, meaningful connections are, you know, a more likely, you know, outcome. And, and we think that seems increasingly important in a time of great isolation. So mm. here are eight of the top tips. Uh, okay. So the first is to acknowledge reality. Now, we are living in really strange times. Um, and when something major is going on, failure to acknowledge that really leads people 
just to disconnect. Um, so it's important to show empathy and create a feeling that we're, you know, you're, we're all in this together, but don't do so do it so much that you're kind of dwelling on it. So mm-hmm. um, having a meeting practice where, uh, you know, before you start the meeting, officially, you know, you acknowledge the, you know, the children, you know, running through the background or the pets, you know, barking, or you ask everyone to share, you know, something they've experienced, something positive or something funny. All of these things, you know, create these human moments that, you know, sort of bring the group together, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, the second, you know, prepare, 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 um, set an agenda, you know, have some meeting guidelines, you know, for example, I mean, if you're running a team meeting and, um, you ask people to read something or come with an idea, you know, really set expectations, uh, and, uh, and lead by example. So I think it's a really good opportunity if you've had no meeting norms, um, that you establish them. And if you've had, you know, kind of meeting norms that were constantly being violated, that you maybe take some opportunity to, you know, to reset the efficacy of your, your meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, third is active facilitation, like whether a meeting is face to face or it's virtual, um, it's typically going to run better when, you know, someone takes the lead and, you know, the leader has to work, um, to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly, that it stays on time, and it produces meaningful connections. So, you know, unfortunately, leaders, uh, that means more work for you. You've got to be the one that's sort of searching the Brady Bunch screen to see who um, is hanging back and find ways to, you know, to draw them out. You're the one that needs to be connecting the dots to really uh, say, you know, John, you've got some expertise in this area. Can you share um, some insight with the, you know, the group? So uh, I think the meetings that have a captain run better. And the great thing, and, you know, Kevin Sanchez uh, pointed this out because he's a, an institutional consultant. So he's doing a lot of virtual investment committee meetings. So he's got the, you know, Brady Bunch of 12, you know, investment committee members on the screen. His observation was like, when you have the whole committee on one screen, it's easier to observe who's engaged and who's not, who looks confused. So as a meeting leader, you're better, you're actually better able to engage than you are in a live setting, which seems kind of crazy. Um, But you're better equipped to pick up on, you know, visual cues and to ensure um, that you, you know, kind of address questions or confusion um, or, uh, you know, kind of draw in the person who's kind of out to lunch. Mm-hmm. Number four, um, encourage and expect participation. Um, and this kind of speaks to the whole, um, you know, establishing or reestablishing uh, meeting norm bit. You know, for team meetings, you know, create the expectation that everyone participates. So, Having a good agenda, having a good cadence um, to a meeting will help it, you know, flow more naturally. Um, And assigning tasks to team members, giving people new responsibilities can help to draw, you know, everyone out and and get them engaged. So those are my four. And uh, now, Kathleen, I know you have a a bunch of thoughts on uh, meeting etiquette. Absolutely. So our fifth tip is to really practice good meeting etiquette. And it's different for virtual meetings. Some of it's the same, but virtual meetings have a couple of unique uh, etiquette uh, points that we wanted to, to make. The first is to show up early. And to your point, Bob, if you don't know how to use the technology, learn it before the meeting. Um, make sure that your technology is ready to go. If you have any doubts at all, try to log on early so that you're not holding the meeting up. If it is a video conference, then make sure your camera is on. There, it's really disconcerting if you're on a video meeting and three people uh, have their video on and two others have it off. It throws off the entire cadence on, of the meeting. So if it's a video meeting, video is on. Mute. You should mute when it's appropriate. So if, if somebody's giving a presentation, that's a great time to mute your sound. But you don't want to mute during a discussion. Um, so use it judiciously. 
Screen sharing is another thing. Uh, if you're going to be sharing a, your screen, then it's a really good idea that you're only sharing the document that you want to share. Close your windows, log off IM, log off your email, or set it to do not disturb so that's not popping up either on top or in the background of what you're doing, uh, which brings me to background. You really do want to be cognizant of what your background says about you. And this is something, Bob, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, but this is something that we've paid a lot of attention to through this crisis. Uh, and you can see it on television. You know, we, we, we're always watching reporters and anchors to see what their background is and, and what it says about them. And, and you do notice when someone doesn't you pay do. attention to it, <laughs> you really do. Yeah. It's, you know, and it, it makes you question credibility almost. I mean, I was watching a portfolio manager talk yesterday on CNBC and he had empty bookshelves behind him. And that yeah. it, I, it so distracted me. I, I barely heard what he said. So it does matter if you are not in an ideal office situation, then certainly there's virtual backgrounds that you can use on uh, the video conferencing apps. And then finally, and this is probably the most important thing, you want to manage what's in your frame. And here's what I mean. You want to understand what your fellow team members or clients can see on the screen. So first example, just, uh, you know, recently there was an ABC reporter um, that was being interviewed on Good Morning America and he had no pants right. on. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I mean, you know, it's all funny. It's gone viral and he's been really good natured about it. Um, he, he, he claims he had shorts on uh, and you couldn't see anything, but it just went viral on Twitter. So, you know, you want to know what's in the screen. There was uh, early on when the crisis started, there was one that was going viral and it was a woman going to the bathroom during a Zoom meeting. You know, um, and just keep in mind that if there's a document up on the like if you have a document on your screen, everybody else can still see you and whatever you're doing. So pay attention to that. I'll just I'll just add this one story, which is my son is a was a film student and he was applying for a job over a Skype call. And uh, because he was a film student, he understood the importance of stagecraft. And so he had three points of light and he had the appropriate books in his bookcase behind him and uh, and on and on and on. And anyway, he was able to get the job. It was a it was uh, with a job with the New York Film Academy. And uh, because he had done all those things in advance, he was able to get the job because they they recognized that he understood how to um, uh, frame himself and how to present himself and how to have an appropriate background. So not that everyone here who's listening is applying for a job at a film company, but it does matter, I think. It does. It absolutely does. It says a lot about you. Um, so the sixth tip we wanted to talk about is what we call the virtual water cooler. Um, now, all meetings, it's really important to close out the meeting. And what I mean is, you know, summarizing, creating action items or deliverables, assigning accountability, that should be done in every meeting. Um, but there's another thing that you have to take into account when it's a virtual meeting, and it's what we call the virtual water cooler. We have all been in those face-to-face -face meetings where the most important conversation happened after the meeting in the hallways at the quote unquote water cooler, mm -hmm. right? Well, with a virtual meeting, you need to make sure you get the, those issues out on the table. So you want to make sure that as you're ending the meeting, you're asking questions like, what have we missed? Are, you know, are there any concerns or potential objections that we didn't consider today? Um, and hopefully by asking those questions, you'll uncover what typically happens in the hallways or at the mm -hmm. water cooler. Our, our seventh tip is a little, um, it's not intuitive. It's don't overuse video. And I alluded to this before with the social hours um, and the social events, but there's been articles that have been published on Zoom fatigue. And, you know, we looked into really why are you getting so tired when you're video conferencing? So a couple things. The first thing is that being on a video call requires more focus than a face-to-face -face meeting. And all of us are working harder to process nonverbal cues like facial expressions. Um, silence is actually another challenge in video conferencing. In real life, uh, silence can generally be part of the natural rhythm of a conversation. Um, but when it happens on a video chat, it can make people really uncomfortable. And also when we're on camera, and I know this has happened to everyone who's listening to this, if you're doing any virtual meetings, we are very aware of being watched. It's almost like being on stage. So you've got this pressure to perform, except you can see yourself in real time. So these are all strains 
um, that are making us tired. So if you get to the end of a day where you've done a lot of video conferencing and you feel exhausted, you know, this is why you're tired. And you're going to add on top of that all the other circumstances that we're going through, you know, lockdown, quarantine, um, you know, the worries about the world, the markets, your job, you know, working from home, all of that's feeding into our feelings of exhaustion. So our advice is to only use to use your video conferencing judiciously. Not all meetings need to be on video to be effective. So think through why you're using the video function and schedule your meetings accordingly. And and then the last area that I want to touch on is it's a big one and I'm going to give you like a 30,000 foot. It's, it's the whole concept of technology. Um, and I'm going to touch quickly on four things, video conferencing solutions, equipment, network bandwidth and security. So in terms of your video conferencing solutions, some of you are going to be required to use the solution that your firm provides. But if you have the freedom to choose your own solution, you want to consider elements like ease of use, not only for you and your team, but also for your clients. Uh, certainly security. Uh, what are the additional bells and whistles you want? Do you need breakout rooms? Do you need to the, the ability to do cloud recording? Um, and regardless of what oh, cost, of course, too, is also another factor that you're going to consider. But regardless of what technology you choose, it's imperative that you get really comfortable with it. Yeah. So in terms of equipment, you know, laptops, computers, if they're updated and they're newer versions, that can go a long way towards creating a seamless remote working experience for your team. Um, in terms of processing, you want to make sure that your laptop has a minimum, minimum of two gigabytes of RAM to support modern video teleconferencing or modern video conferencing. I'm sorry. And then you've got to also think about your webcam. And again, really updated computers tend to have really great webcams. But if you have an older computer, this is an add on that you can purchase. Uh, so you want a high resolution webcam for video conferencing and you also want a, a great uh, noise canceling headset mm -hmm. for these events. Um, so there's a lot of popular ones out there, you know, and even the Apple headsets work and the earbuds work, but you want to have a good headset. And finally, if you're doing video conferencing um, in terms of equipment, your lighting is really important. So if your webcam doesn't have good lighting, that's a very expensive add on that you can purchase to to get good lighting. Now, in terms of network bandwidth, and I don't want to get in the weeds here, but it's really critical that all of your team members have the appropriate network bandwidth to use all of their applications remotely. And everybody has to remember that everyone who's using the bandwidth in your home um, is going to impact whether or not that bandwidth is enough, right? So if you're working remotely, you have a spouse or partner working remotely, you have kids doing online learning, people are streaming, all of that impacts your bandwidth. And, you know, my suggestion is, you know, listen, you can read all about this or you can just call your local provider and they will, they can very easily talk through what your needs are and make sure that you have the right one. But it does bring up something that's important. And that is if you're asking staff members to upgrade their bandwidth, that's an added cost for them. And so that may be an appropriate expense that the firm covers. So just think, think that through before you insist on upgraded bandwidth. And finally, um, security. And you could spend hours just talking about this. But when you're work working remotely, you cannot just assume that because you're using a home office network or a home office issued laptop that you've checked that security box. Because all customer security and privacy rules still apply when we're working from home. So if this is the first time your business continuity plan has really been tested, um, you need to consider things like passwords, updated software, encryption, backups, antivirus software, and Wi-Fi security. You know, you want your Wi-Fi to be, network to be private with a password. So all of those things matter. And doing a security check um, or having someone do that for your team is really important. So those those are uh, our eight tips. I know we we spent quite a bit of time on them, but but we think they're really important to creating good video conferencing experiences. Well, those are great tips, and I and I I take it that some of them may or may not be available on the website, your website. Well, um, we haven't. We typically don't make our content available uh, to all on our website, but I, if we're working with uh, with Tony Davido. I, I think we're probably going to put a like a more succinct article in um, in the monitor sometime in the future. Great. Okay. So we've talked. We spoke. We've spoken about the current state of affairs. We've addressed best practices. 
Um, what does the future hold in store? What What are the downstream effects? Uh, what are the permanent shifts that uh, we need, that FAs need to be mindful of? Well, Bob, I think the first thing that we all have to be aware of is that the world has fundamentally changed because of this pandemic. And there's going to be a lot of lasting changes that come out of that. And one of those is that remote work is here to stay. And it's not just uh, a pandemic that can make this happen. There's other things that could trigger it. It might be a natural disaster. It might be an injury. I had a friend who had a severe foot injury that required her to do six weeks of no weight bearing activity. So she could not go in the office. Um, you know, I have another friend in Seattle who the bridge that he uses to commute into the city literally has been shut down for two and a half years. And that took his 30 minute commute to an hour and three quarters to go around. Yeah. Right. So, so there's a lot of things that can happen that trigger this. Um, you know, this, this period of mandated shutdowns has really created a decreased tolerance for long commutes, crappy work environments. You know, people are realizing that the office could literally be the worst place on the planet to get the isolation and focus you need to do real strategic work. Um, and bottom line here, I think, is that talent wars are really going to be won in the future by the companies that have great remote work capacity. And we certainly know that the upcoming generations, it's very, very important to them. Um, it's going to accelerate people's plans to live where they love, to achieve work-life balance. Um, but you do need to approach this as a team leader with a leadership mindset. You need to focus on productivity, not hours worked or FaceTime in the office. And that really requires leaders to think through the metrics for the various positions on the team. And Christine, I know you have a lot of thoughts about this. Yeah. You know, I'll just briefly add that, you know, as, as we look forward to a world where remote work is more prevalent, that increases the need for managers and leaders to learn how to maintain accountability and the quality of work in a remote setting. So if you don't have a culture, a culture of accountability now, you'll need protocols and systems to really help you manage better in the future. Um, and I also think there's significant ramifications, some we just can't even fathom yet, um, and especially for RAs with regard to how you think about one of your biggest ticket line items in your expense column, which is office space. We just, we may not need um, as much as we previously had. I mean, and Kathleen and I have had conversations recently with a number of folks who work at big companies who are also just sort of re-examining, you know, what branch office, uh, you know, network is needed um, in the future. So, um, yeah, uh, if, if real estate falls in, in your, you know, purview, I think, you know, thinking about, um, you know, the most efficient way that your office can run in the future virtually and, uh, and physically is an important question for leaders to contemplate right now. Mm. So part of your research also looked at what you've described as the rise of the boundaryless FA. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I think uh, you know I think this was certainly a trend before, but it I see it accelerating. So FAs with a specific expertise and an active referral network nationwide. I believe will win an increasing number of out-of-state referrals. And my example, um, again, is one of my favorite FAs, um, Heather Locus from BDF. She runs their divorce practice group, and she has a national reputation. She's written a book. She's written a number of chapters in other people's books. She's always on panels. Um, she writes articles, um, and she receives uh, referrals from attorneys all over the country. Um, but in the past, you know, many prospects, you know, certainly wanted to have, you know, a face-to-face -face meeting at the outset and felt more comfortable having someone with, you know, hiring someone for their divorce, um, you know, the management of their finances and their divorce with someone who's local. But I, I think that with increased acceptance of virtual meetings as an alternative, she can really see her out-of-state business, you know, picking up and She's someone who travels regularly. So picking up a new client in a virtual first fashion with a face-to-face -to, -face to follow at some critical point in the divorce process um, just makes sense. 
you know, there, there's a, a, a term, a, a new term of art that I suspect will come into uh, our world, right? We used to have DM as direct message or PM as private message, but now VM, right, is becoming a, a term of art, or of art, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, anything that we haven't covered? Any last pieces of, of advice? Well, I, I would say that you need a continuity plan. Now, RIAs have always had to have a business continuity plan, but other advisors have not. And everybody needs that business continuity plan, and they need to work their plan. And here's what I mean. You should be examining – um, what has been working and what hasn't been working in terms of your remote work environment, whether you're a sole practitioner or a team. And you should start thinking through how to correct the things that weren't working, whether it was, you know, maybe it was hardware. Uh, that people need upgraded hardware. Maybe there are some people on the team who really don't have an appropriate office space at home. And how do you think through that? Um, you know, maybe you struggled with some of the remote applications, whatever it might be. Now is the time to think through that, create a plan. And then I would encourage you to practice that plan. Even if you end up, um, you know, when this is all over someday and you end up back in the office um, on a daily basis, we would suggest that at least two days a month, your entire team works remotely so that you're always practicing your plan and you're always ready because this is a different world we live in today. Mm. Christine? Yeah, I mean, I really think that for FAs that are looking to grow their practice, I mean, you just mentioned it, the, the VM advisor uh, you know, becoming really great at virtual meetings and virtual events um, is the thing to do. This crisis has permanently altered the virtual meeting, virtual event adoption curve. I mean, you know, my 85-year-old in-laws, we did a Zoom meeting last night with them. I mean, <laughs> it's here to stay. So the fact is, you know, virtual virtual meetings are undeniably less taxing, less costly, and more efficient for advisors to do, you know, en masse. So I think, you know, FAs that master the ability to deliver timely and helpful insights to clients and prospects in a virtual setting are really setting themselves up for growth. And, and I, 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 we think the time to experiment with this is, you know, is now while people are still giving passes for, you know, clunky tech and still uh, more forgiving than they will be in the future. Mm. Well, um, uh, Christine, Kathleen, this, this has been an incredibly useful uh, podcast from my perspective. I, I can't imagine any FA, any team listening to this and not coming away with multiple ideas to implement in their practice. So, um, so thank you. Thanks for having us. Yep. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of our special series, Exceptional Advisors in Extraordinary Times. My guests were Christine Gaze, the founder and managing partner of Purpose Consulting Group, and Kathleen Pritchard, a partner in Purpose Consulting Group. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then don't miss our Exceptional Advisor webinar series hosted by Tony Davidow, available at investmentsandwealth.org. Stay up to date and have the latest episode delivered straight to you by subscribing through iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Institute stands ready to help you as you navigate these turbulent times with new resources, research, programs, accommodations for candidates, and certificates. For more details on resources available, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org.